<clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Uh, today, we're going to be talking uh, August 15, 1971, when Nixon deregulated the dollar. The National Infrastructure Bank will reverse the 50-year economic decline that we have been experiencing. It's the only hope we have, and so the best way to find out how uh, to be able to do that is to listen from some of our experts. And today we're going to start with Alfeka Mutari, who's a former economist for the International Monetary Fund. The floor is yours, Alfeka. Thank you very much and welcome to everyone. Very nice to see so many uh, returning faces and also some new folks on this call. So I'm a macroeconomist and to talk about what's happened since uh, Nixon deregulated and took us off the gold standard, um, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about long-term history and long-term economic trends. And to do that, I'm going to focus on what happened to the creation of money after Nixon took us off the gold standard, how this uh, helped, uh, led to unintended consequences, like the fact that we were spending less of our money creation to build new capital systems, new business buildings, new roads, all those kinds of things, all that declined and de-industrialized de our economy. Uh, the fact that the financial system then became set up to reward the stock market over real investment in the economy, creating inflation, asset bubbles that led to cycles of recessions and federal debt increases, income inequality increased, and economic growth slowed. So how, did it, how does this work? Uh, what happened after Nixon took us off the gold standard is that our sort of industrialization came to a stop. You can see this in the very famous chart of a French economist named Thomas Piketty. In 2011, he wrote a book called Cap uh, Capitalism in the 21st Century. And he boiled it all down to this chart. What he said is that for the longest period of time, uh, the rate of return to Investing in real infrastructure kept the economy growing. So from 1800, for example, this is a, a global a plot of the global um, rates of return, but the same is true for the U.S. economy as well. So in the U.S., uh, our industrialization period ran from about 1800 up to uh, about, it's it sort of peaked and ended in the year 2000. And what happened was every time we invested in our economy, built roads, infrastructure, businesses, built new plants, that kind of thing, uh, it was it would came back to uh, us in higher growth rates. Uh, and that was great for uh, the economy for a while. But then what took over was the financialization of the economy starting in around uh, the time that Nixon deregulated the dollar, uh, the rates of return from investing in capital, that is putting your money into the stock market or into uh, speculative ventures, hoping that uh, the prices of those things would increase in, uh, in value, that took over and surpassed our growth rate. And what Piketty said is when you have an economy where the rate of return on capital, investing in the stock market, far exceeds the growth rate in the economy, then you have greater returns going to the upper 10% of the population, the upper who mo own most of the stocks to the upper 1%, and uh, much less returns to workers who are actually going out and building things. And this led to a whole bunch of unfortunate things. So our, our uh, industrial period ended around 1971, and um, it ended, um, a lot of this was financed by four development banks in the United States that provided off-budget sp spending for, for infrastructure investments, great paying jobs, built electrification, uh, new roads, all that kind of stuff in our economy just flew into growth period. But in the post-industrial period, uh, money creation went to the financial sector, 
the returns were greater than there, and our growth slowed down to about 1.8% per year. So that's the basic fundamental chart. And you can see that the implications are that we became the United States, deindustrialized and a consumer economy. So here's a chart. Our economy became a consumption economy. Our, our share of consumption in the whole, everything we produce grew. And our capital formation, how much we're spending out of what we produce to build new plants and new um, businesses, that fell. And when that falls, and also our investment in roads and those other kinds of things fell, when that happens, we are become deindustrialized and we become less competitive vis-a-vis -vis our competitors, especially with respect to China. We become less, they China advanced because they had three massive investment banks that developed their economy. And you could see how their capital formation grows and grows and grows, this red line, and ours is going down, this blue line is going down. So compared to China, we're becoming less competitive. What we our economy needs is more bridges, not more fridges, to, uh, to kind of paraphrase an article that came out in the news. So another bad uh, uh, aspect of the de and, uh, regulation of Nixon was that it's, it's because we're consuming more, we're producing less, uh, we're very much more sensitive to inflation. So here is a plot of inflation, the consumer price index going up here, and the supply of goods going down here. So it, it surpassed, and a lot of it was due to the fact that in the Nixon era, he was trying to spend too much in the budget, and he was carrying on wars in Vietnam and other places. And when you did that, you stoked inflation, then the Fed came along and tried to control the inflation by tamping down on the economy, causing recessions, these, these gray bands here, one after another. And then you need the budget to come along and deficit spend to bail us out of the recession. So all of those cycles were really bad for the economy and really raised inflation and the national debt, as I'll show you in just a moment. But it really kick-started inflation when we spent a lot of money in the budget to get us out of the COVID pandemic recession. And you could see inflation really picked up at that point. So uh, that was another bad aspect of the deregulation. Compare that to an earlier period when we had the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, FDR's bank, investing in the economy, building roads, bridges, electrification, and GDP was rising faster than inflation. So it depends on what kind of things you spend your money on, this money creation. If you spend it on investment goods, you grow the economy faster. If you spend it on consumption goods, then you, you just stoke inflation. The next uh, big picture is what happened to the federal debt. Uh, this has been a very big problem. Let's start in the Nixon years. Uh, you can see right here that each time Nixon tried to get us out of one of these recessions caused by too much government spending, then uh, the government debt increased. It improved a little bit under Clinton, but then look what happened in the 2008 financial crisis, really ballooned the federal debt. Uh, again, in, uh, not in the picture here, but it ballooned again, trying to get us out of COVID. Now, according to the Congressional Budget Office, we are on an unsustainable path for our debt. It's going to keep on increasing and doubling as a percent of GDP versus if we had a national infrastructure bank, we can grow the economy faster and bring that path of debt down to a more sustainable level. Same thing that happened after the end of World War II, when debt peaked, trying to uh, um, you know, win World War II. Uh, and then you saw this big plunge in our debt as a percent of GDP. What happened here? We didn't pay the debt back. We simply grew the economy faster as a result of all the uh, investments that, that the RFC made. And our debt became more sustainable as a percent of our GDP. That's what we want to return to, uh, to get us out of this fix, the debt problem. A Another, a, four, a third uh, un, unintended consequence of all this uh, money creation that's not inhibited anymore is that it really stoked income inequality. This is income inequality in 1900. Uh, it went from about 1% uh, of the population taking 20% of all the income earned by everything. It went down to half that much 
1970 and then rose again uh, over the period of financialization because the stock market again is earning a higher rate of return than uh, GDP and real businesses. All that money is flowing to the people that own stocks. 80% uh, of stocks are owned by the top 10%. And so that's how they uh, wind up having much higher incomes than anyone else. And that's a very adverse, uh, what, what do they do with their money? Not very good things. Uh, they make campaign contributions to, you know, uh, government officials that weakens our government. They go out and do things like buy houses with cash that builds up the uh, boosts housing prices. Uh, they take over electric utilities, water companies, and things like that, and then raise the rates for those things. So uh, having too much income inequality is very bad. And in the long run, it is a drag on economic growth, according to a study by the International Monetary Fund. So those are the long-term trends. In the short term, we want to keep our eye on where we are on the economy today. Growth is not doing too badly, but the economy is cooling. Uh, and you can really see that in this chart of U.S. unemployment rates over the last 12 months. They have been increasing uh, every uh, uh, for the last four months. And this is an indication that we could be heading for a recession. Also, uh, the um, inflation has cooled. The CPI is down to below 3% for the first time since it bumped up uh, two years ago. Job creation is slowing, uh, manufacturing is down, income inequality is rising, uh, and that's a really bad thing. The rich have contributed to housing costs again through cash purchases of houses. And then the financial sector is also in trouble. They're holding debt to real estate, uh, which is... Um, suffered ever since COVID and people leaving the office, rising credit card and loan delinquencies, uh, net interest earnings of banks are is falling because interest rates are upside down. And finally, uh, you saw the beginning of August, stock market turmoil really matters. I mean, something as far away as uh, the yen trade in Japan can hit our stock market makes uh, margin calls all over the place. The banks have lent for stock um, speculation on margin calls. And when all those are pulled back, you could have a catastrophic meltdown of the financial system. In addition to which- Alfaka, you're gonna our, have to continue. Our system, Alfaka, our system, Alfaka, yeah. you gotta okay. continue this later because Dr. Prince has gotta be off by 8.30. Okay, so. yeah, I'll, I'll wrap it up. Biden, Bidenomics are not being felt by the working poor. Uh, they're not reaching them. A National Infrastructure Bank will be a solution for all of those things, and a bill in Congress will create a $5, uh, $5 trillion bank to create to provide loans for infrastructure that will really supercharge and boost our economy. So I'll stop there. All right. Thanks a lot, Alfeca, for that. <clears throat> Next, uh, we have uh, Dr. Nomi Prince, uh, PhD author and former Wall Street executive, Los Angeles, California. Welcome, Dr. Prince. Thank you so much. And um, Alfeca, that was the most amazing presentation related to the question that we keep getting as a coalition about whether creating a, quote, $5 trillion bank, but really investment in the country's infrastructure is going to cause inflation. Um, and we've been saying time and time again that it doesn't, because if you can grow the economy more quickly than you can grow debt and you can outpace um, even whatever the inflation rate might be, then that's not going to be the case. If you're going to create better jobs with higher pay that can become a productive component of the economy and equalize that inequality, or at least come a little bit closer, that is not inflation increasing. So I think what we're seeing now and pegging it to Nixon is very interesting. When I wrote all the president's bankers um, a number of years ago, ago in the wake of the financial crisis. Um, I spent quite a bit of time at the Nixon Library as well as other presidential libraries around the country digging into original archives. And it wasn't just that Nixon took the country off the gold standard and basically unmoored the dollar to real assets and therefore allowed effectively the Federal Reserve to create money to bail out banks um, in the wake of COVID and to inflate the money supply net of inflating the economy. Um, this was something that the bank
bankers had wanted at the time as well. And there were major conversations that had gone on back in the early 70s between the likes of J.P. Morgan Chase, it was Chase at the time, and J.P. Morgan was separate, uh, Citibank and the like, that really wanted the Fed to be there and the government to be there to backstop the banking system by more than it had done, because they were concerned about oncoming inflation. Um, and they were concerned about the ability and the tightness of the liquidity of the amount of money that banks could find to lend out to continue to do their day job at the time, which was not taking major leveraged positions and derivative positions, which it has become today, but was more more traditional banking, but still they were concerned. And there was a, a lot of push um, as a result to get the country off of um, the gold standard as we did. And the, the result as Alfeca has shown is that over time, the purchasing power of um, the dollar has declined and the growth in the economy has declined and there has been no counterpoint um, to that decline. And so when inflation rises and inequality rises and the money that is being put to work is being put to mark in financial assets, in that financialization of the economy rather than in real assets or development assets or permanent infrastructure assets, then what we see is this continued unmooring of the individual, the worker, the citizen in the real economy to what's happening in those financial markets. And therefore, it's not a matter of um, an idea that is, is, is time has come, which it is. It's a matter of absolute necessity to basically reverse all of these things that have happened in a time in which our debt is escalating out of control in a way that there is no containing of that debt. And one of the beautiful things about the National Infrastructure Bank's mechanism is that it actually repurposes, we've talked about this here a lot, but um, just in counterpoint to what Alfeca was saying on the financial side, it actually repurposes a portion of that debt. And it says, look, we're gonna take a very small portion of the exorbitant debt that we have created in order to continue to basically run our budget. And we are going to use it as collateral for a bank whose purpose is merely and solely and, and necessarily uh, to increase long-term infrastructure and development in the country. Um, and as a result, increase jobs, as a result, increase working um, environment conditions and so forth, and also progress us competitively. I found that chart 101, the comparison of, of how the U.S. has declined, um, and we know this, but from an industrialization component relative to China, um, so incredibly telling because China has so many development banks and has economic strategies. And I think, and this is something that the National Infrastructure Bank would do for our country, is that not only would it be the only financing mechanism that can remotely get to the amounts of funds that we need to develop our infrastructure for the long term and to upgrade it and to modernize it and to compete, but it also requires by its very um, existence us to have an economic strategy because as a nation, we really haven't had an economic strategy beyond um, sort of borrowing from, from wherever it's possible. And in many cases, that is from other countries. And we can do that because we are the United States. We're strong. We have a military. We have a dollar. It's the, you know it's still the main reserve currency and all of that. Um, but rather than to sort of think ourselves into our future and to have an economic plan that can only be created if we have a financing mechanism for that plan. So I think as we get to um, where we're right now in, in our economic state, as we see um, the jobless figures, unemployment rising, as we see inequality rising, even though growth is slowing, even though inflation has come down, but it's still still outpacing growth, that we have all these negatives and all these, these just strains on our citizens as we have an election moment, as we're going into this time period, that really, for those reasons as well, we should be pushing the idea that this National Infrastructure Bank marries finance with economic strategy. And it's the only thing that not only finances the infrastructure development to actualize that strategy, but it forces the imagining of that strategy by providing the necessary finance. So the two are really commingled. And I think this is a time where we're talking about, you know, if we are looking at unifying what the country really needs and what it's saying it wants, and out of all the politics of it all, um, it is that unifying um, what finance is, what it does, and how it connects into real economic growth. Um, and pride and competitiveness um, is really something that the National Infrastructure Bank can produce. Thank you very much for those uh, comments and thoughts on that. Uh, it, it really gets down to, uh, we have had a strategy in this country of 
a two-year cycle. It's get reelected and then change your path and get reelected or get unelected and change policy, change policy. We have yet to actually go back and actually have a long-term strategy. We're on a two-year or shorter term thing because even two years is probably too long. They probably only do a year and then it's re-election time. So very wise words. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next, you. we're going to move on to uh, Ellen Brown, who's the founder of the Public Banking Institute in Los Angeles, California. So the floor is yours, uh, Ellen. Ellen is working on this. I'm going to get do a quick pitch here for some of the things that uh, are going on currently with the NIB. The NIB continues uh, to uh, work and talk to uh, all kinds of uh, congressional a congressional uh, senators and also to the uh, representatives. And right now we are actually gearing up to go and uh, be at the uh, Democratic National Convention this uh, upcoming week. We've actually uh, gotten a booth and we are going to be one of the vendors there. And uh, there's going to be about 20 of us who are out there who are going to be trying to make sure that we sell our <clears throat> what this idea is to the people. Because the biggest thing is it's been a big secret and we're going to try and put some light on it as it goes on. So looks like Ellen's ready to go. So Ellen. Okay, uh, so <laughs> some of this will be redundant, sorry. So the federal okay. debt is, is now up to, it's officially up to $34.6 trillion. The debt itself really isn't the problem. I mean, they keep rolling over the debt, but what's the problem is the interest on the debt. Uh, interest costs actually went down uh, for a number of years, uh, interest on the federal debt, because uh, the Federal Reserve dropped the, the interest rate, the prime rate so low, it was almost zero, uh, but the problem was those very low rates allowed all sorts of speculators who had access to them to create bubbles, and the bubbles created inflation. So that forced the Fed to raise interest rates, at least that, that's what they thought was their best. We could argue about whether that was the best thing to do, but that's what they did. So now interest payments are up to over a trillion dollars a year, and they're going up beyond that. Um, uh, so and so for the first time they've actually passed uh, military spending, which is also close to a trillion dollars. So between the two of those, they pretty much eat up the budget, and there's not much left over for <clears throat> public goods and infrastructure. But uh, we've been here before, and we've gotten out of it before. It, at the end of the Revolutionary War, uh, the co colonies, or the, which were then the states, were $44 million in debt, which was a huge debt for the time. So Congress debated whether the federal government should undertake to pay this debt. And Hamilton, who was the first U.S. secretary, said, yes, we should. Uh, we could use that for... Um, we could do debt for equity swaps and use the debt for capital for a bank. So that's what they did. State debt was accepted in partial payment for stock in the US, first US bank <laughs> paying a 6% dividend. So that's the same model that the uh, NIB proposes. Uh, the bank leveraged this capital into credit issued as the first US currency. Of course, then they issued currency as paper money. They didn't have computers to digitize it the way we do today. Uh, and they created money uh, based on the fractional reserve model, which was the Bank of e England model. Hamilton wrote, it is a well-established fact that banks in good credit can circulate a far greater sum than the actual quantum of their capital in gold and silver. So that's fractional reserve banking. And even today, that is where most of our money comes from. The, the Bank of England wrote in 2014 in their quarterly report, Banks do not act simply as intermediaries, lending out deposits to savers place with them, and nor do they multiply up central bank money to create new loans and deposits. Commercial banks actually create money in the form of bank deposits by making new loans. In fact, they said bank deposits make up 97% of the amount of money currently in circulation. The difference between the US bank, first U.S. bank and the Bank of England was that the U.S. bank was basically a national infrastructure and development bank. Its primary function, according to Hamilton, was to issue credit to the government and private interests for internal improvements and other economic development. That was according to Hamilton's system of public credit, which he wrote quite a bit on. The second U.S. bank followed the same model 
um, and it was under the second U.S. Bank particularly that development took off, including such rather remarkable achievements as building the Erie Canal. But Jack Jackson shut the second U.S. Bank down, and that left Lincoln without a funding me mechanism. He came into office dealing with a civil war and no way to fund it except to borrow from British bank backed bankers at 26 to 30, 24 to 36 percent interest. So basically, we would have been debt slaves to the British or the British backed bankers. Uh, so what he did instead was to revert to the American system. The original American system was actually the colonists who just issued their own paper money directly. So that's what uh, Lincoln did, issued paper greenbacks uh, or U.S. notes, and to the extent that he actually doubled the money supply. And... Besides that, uh, his government founded the national bank system, which uh, required in, for banks to join the, the system, which was actually necessary to stabilize the banks because they were all over the place at that time. Uh, they had to capitalize themselves with, um, or they would get bank notes, national bank notes, and, but they had to capitalize themselves with government debt. So again, it was uh, debt for equity swaps. And between those two sources of funding, we, uh, or the North prevailed in the Civil War, and we did a great deal of economic development, including building the Transcontinental Railroad, which actually turned a profit for the government. Um, but in, so in 1913, we got the Federal Reserve after there was a major banking crisis in 1906. And uh, in response to that, the Federal Reserve was set up to save the banks. It was actually owned by the banks, and it was basically there to save the banks. But they failed to prevent the worst bank runs in history after we had the crash of 29. And, you know, again, it was a speculative thing. And 9,000 banks failed, $7 billion in deposits were frozen. The money supply shrank, and the Fed failed to save the day. So that left uh, Franklin Roosevelt with a, a collapsed economy and, again, no banking system to fund his way out of it. So um, Jesse Jones was appointed as chair of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, and a USA or government agency that was set up under Hoover, the previous Republican governor, or sorry, president. And he repurposed it. It was it too was set up to save the banks, but he repurposed it to fund development. Um, it started with a modest five hundred million dollars in capitalization. It was not actually a bank, but it issued bonds to get liquidity, and it lent or invested over the next twenty five years over forty billion dollars, uh, funding the New Deal in World War II or our participation in it. And we'll rebuilding the dep depressed economy and returning a net profit to the government for all that. So $40 billion in new, new money without consumer price inflation. So why was there no inflation, as, <laughs> as the previous speakers have pointed out? Because uh, it was balanced by the supply went up with demand, that the, the money went into productive purposes, not just speculative financialization. And you can see from this chart that inflation didn't really take off until <laughs> the 1970s, strangely. Uh, Post-war pr prosperity uh, created a middle class that was the envy of the world. And the, so the wages kept up with, uh, you know, the lower and the upper moved up in lockstep right up until, uh, well, the 70s or the 80s when it split into what we have now, the financialized system. Uh, and again, it's the Chinese that have demonstrated how to get out of this sort of trap. Uh, the Chinese built 26,000 miles of high-speed rail in 15 years, along with the world's largest dam and power station. How they did it, the government owns 80% of Chinese banking assets, including three massive development banks. Government banks funded the projects with credit, so they just issued the money as credit, and then the fees from the things they built, the trains and the electricity, uh, repaid the loans. Uh, over the course of 23 years, China's money supply actually grew by 1,800%, which is huge. And yet there was no inflation, as you can see here. And again, the reason was supply went up with demand. As long as you put the money into productivity, you don't get inflation. You get productivity. 
So that's what we need to do, off-budget financing, like the RFC and the China Development Bank, which can fund programs without legislative approval and without counting toward budget, budget experience, expenditures. And that's the proposal of HR 4052, of course, which will be capitalized with federal securities paying a 2% dividend, redeemable after 20 years, designed to be a depository bank, creating money as deposits when it makes loans. But if that doesn't work as a source of liquidity, they can it can also issue bonds the way the Reconstruction Finance Corporation did. It could lend $5 trillion over a period of years and rebuild the country, restore the middle class, and create a 21st century renaissance. Okay, that's all I got. Pretty simple, huh? So all we have to do is get the NIB and, and amazingly, a lot of things can get resolved. Yeah. Um, it, it's The thing is, it's this is not a new idea. This is an old idea. And uh, it's about time that we go back and, and explore some of those uh, remedies that actually work and, and uh, go back, as they say, to when uh, we were able to take our debt turn it and uh, be able to invest in ourselves instead of just continuing to just spend, spend, spend. So thank you very much for that, Ellen. Uh, next, I'm going to ask Senator David Kohler if uh, he'd like to make a few comments here. Floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, well, what I have to add is, uh, is probably from a political perspective, but uh, I, I think it makes a lot of sense because uh, we know that uh, infrastructure helps uh, our economy. And uh, certainly we've seen that in the state of Illinois uh, back when uh, uh, we had the, the severe recession of uh, 08. Uh, Illinois uh, came uh, in, 19, in, in 2009 and we passed a $31 billion capital bill. Uh, of all the states in the, in the union at that point, uh, there was about $39 billion that were dedicated towards uh, capital expenditures in the states. Illinois had 31 billion of that. And so, uh, you know, it, it really helped us. It, it helped sustain our economy and uh, put people to work. Uh, in 2019, we came back and we passed a $45 billion uh, capital bill along with the federal monies that then became available. Um, we've seen an expansion of, uh, of all kinds of infrastructure projects. Uh, you know, our highways are in good shape. Our bridges are being rebuilt. We're building schools, building libraries. Um, so this is, a, I think, a key component of, of our economy. And so it makes a lot of sense that we would have an NIB uh, to do this on a national level and to take, as you say, the, I mean, uh, the treasury is, is really an asset that we can tap into and use. And so we do that and we convert it into, um, again, putting people to work and building things that we, that we need, that we uh, uh, see in our communities. Uh, I just think it makes a lot of sense. I don't know what other strategy uh, has as much promise as this. So, um, you know, I'm happy to be uh, involved in this. Uh, uh, we are working on a resolution uh, in the Illinois uh, legislature uh, to promote this. Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, we'll, we'll have a good time in, in Chicago next week. I'm a delegate. Uh, I, I will be at the uh, the meeting on Monday and, uh, and meet some of you in person. And uh, uh, I, I think we're gonna be able to sell this uh, to the, especially to the DNC folks, and hopefully then to the nation. Right. Well, at the end of the day, uh, this will benefit all Americans. And so the best thing to do is try to get uh, uh, all the people on board. First, you get the willing, and then you get drag along the rest. Of them. Or as right. I always like to say, you do all the hard work, the politicians run to the front, <laughs> take credit for the parade, <laughs> and there we go. That's all we got to do. All That's all we have to work. do. <laughs> That's all we have to do. All right. All uh, right. Thank you very much for those comments. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Assemblywoman uh, Joanne Simon from New York if uh, she'd like to add a few comments here. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, you know, this is um, uh, the, 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 the nib is something that literally uh, uh, 65 assembly members signed on to a letter supporting it. Uh, last year. Uh, and that's because we have not been like Illinois. Uh, we have a lot of bridges and roads and culverts, et, et cetera, that are in great need of repair. 
Um, we haven't invested in our infrastructure. And so everybody throughout the state is very concerned about this. Regardless of what side of the aisle you're on, everybody's very concerned about this. And um, I think that this is an idea that whose time has come. Um, obviously, it, as other people will uh, know better, the, uh, the actual banking system and how this works, uh, the reality is that um, we don't really have a choice. Uh, in many respects, to be able to do what it is we need to do to uh, move our country forward, uh, improve our economy, improve our infrastructure in so many ways, and address all of those issues that really uh, affect climate uh, and or climate effects, um, our need for our water and sewer systems to be better, our need for our construction to be uh, to be better, um, and uh, and and to just really just work at infrastructure in all of its manifestations um, throughout the country. So uh, I'm very happy to be part of this and to uh, keep talking about this and uh, proselytizing about the need to do this uh, around the country. We really do need a federal uh, blueprint for um, reviving our economy and improving our infrastructure around the country. Thank you very much for those comments. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, Ellen Green who's a former Missouri House of Representatives uh, or House uh, Representative uh, from St. Louis, Missouri. So, Alan, the floor is yours. First of all, good evening. I have enjoyed all the comments and I was actually taking a few notes here and there. And uh, I wanted to talk about, when we talk about infrastructure, is building communities from the inside out. You know, what, what happens when neighborhoods start to change? and the sewer systems and the housing values change and, and people move out of communities. No one, no one can doubt that most American cities these days are deeply troubled places. At the root of the problems are the massive economic shifts that we're talking about as we speak. And how do we address those issues? The infrastructure bill. Hundreds of thousands of industrial jobs have either disappeared or moved away from the central cities and its neighborhoods. And while many downtown areas or neighborhoods have experienced a renaissance, the jobs created there are different from those that once sustained the neighborhoods. Either these new jobs are highly professionalized or require elaborate education and credentials for entry, or they are routine, low paying service jobs without much of a future. In effect, these shifts in the economy and particularly in disappearance of decent employment opportunities from low income neighborhoods have removed the bottom run from the fabled American dream, our ladder of opportunities. When we talk about, again, the infrastructure bill, we have to go back and address, again, roads, bridges, housing, the creation of jobs, and especially our sewer systems are aging. That's why it's so important that we get this completed. As we all know, especially on this call, the infrastructure bill that we have today only covered 10%. We need the other 90% to be covered. And that is why it's so important. And so I just wanted to say how we build and how we address America, we have to start from the inside out. Thank you. Thanks for those words. Uh, it kind of reminds me that one of the things we have to make sure we focus on at the end of the day is not so much the debt. Uh, the debt is extremely, <clears throat> let me back up. We can't panic because we have debt to be able to do it. We have to figure out how to be able to move forward instead of saying the only way to eliminate debt's cut. We will never, ever, ever, no matter what, be able to uh, cut enough spending to do our debt. As was pointed out earlier, when you're getting one trillion a year in interest, how do you cut one trillion out of a budget that we currently have? It's impossible. The only that the only way we'll actually be able to actually solve any of this is we actually have to grow so that we can get out of the debt. We got to outgrow it in order to do it. That's what's happened in the past. That's the only way we'll solve this problem. So that's something to keep in mind as we're moving and talking to uh, representatives, both on the Republican and the Democratic side to be able to do it, that we all want to be physically responsible. The only way to be physically responsible is we have to start to invest in ourselves instead of just saying, hey, let's, let's make up this funny money and let's keep on going here. So thank you so much for those words. Onward, uh, Dennis Montoya. Uh, he is a <clears throat> uh, past state director of the New Mexico League of United Latino American Citizens. So uh, the floor is yours, Dennis. 
Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Listening to the other speakers, it seems to me that the common thread that weaves together what everyone is saying is transformation. And transformation is what we need, and we certainly need economic transfer transformation. I'm going to talk a little bit about my family's journey, uh, starting with the New Deal era, starting with the last incarnation of a national infrastructure bank, uh, and try and hook that together with what everyone else is saying about what we need, because the bottom line is we are not going to transform our economy without transforming our society. My father was Ferdinando Florencio Montoya. He was born in 1918 in a tiny village in northern New Mexico in a house without running water or indoor uh, plumbing or any of the amenities that people are accustomed to these days. And he made his career in the armed services after he did a number of other things including mining coal, uh, including uh, picking melons in Colorado. He entered the service. But before he did that, he worked for the Civilian Conservation Corps. The CCC, um, along with other New Deal projects, were transformative for the state of New Mexico. So I'm going to take a moment and talk a little bit about the history of our state. We have the oldest capital city in the continental United States, Santa Fe, New Mexico, founded in 1598. We were not admitted to the Union as a state until 1912, six years before my dad was born. What's that all about? We had the oldest European-style uh, established communities anywhere this side of the Mississippi. What is that all about? Well, it's all about some of the basic problems that we are now dealing with, and that has to do with economic, social, racial, and ethnic disparity. So my dad's sojourn with the CCC was a leg up for him. It was a, it was a way for him to advance and and move into uh, a full career. My dad retired as a master sergeant. He was a teacher of finance administration. So I am today a teacher of mathematics, currently at the, um, at the high school and mid-school level, but I'm also a retired civil rights lawyer, 25 years of it. The little postage stamp area of New Mexico uh, where my dad was born and where I grew up has produced more terminal degree candidates than any similarly situated community in the country. And it wasn't done with National Infrastructure Bank money, but it was done mostly uh, with incentives that came along with Lyndon Johnson's Great Society programs, which were built on the bones of the um, New Deal, the New Deal programs that my dad worked for. What I'm driving at is this. The League of United Latin American Citizens supports the National Infrastructure Bank because we believe it will give our representative communities a fair and even deal at equal access to the American dream. What could we do with adequate funding? At one of these sessions, I presented a short video entitled The Water Lady. Within 100 miles of Albuquerque, New Mexico, our communities in the Navajo Nation that live very much as my dad's, in my dad's time when he was born, without indoor plumbing, without water access, in conditions that many would call much worse than the third world. If we are to revitalize our economy, we must not ignore any sector of our people. Native Latinos, immigrant Latinos, Native Americans 
all the people that historically have been passed over need to have a seat at the table and LULAC sees that, or at least LULAC New Mexico um, sees that the National Infrastructure Bank that is proposed will give us a seat at the table and will enable a supercharging of our local economies. Just one example of something that would create an incredible number of jobs and uh, a surge in the economy is something that is frequently discussed in these sessions. And that is a um, high-speed train. If we put one along the course of Interstate 25 from El Paso, Texas, all the way up to either Denver or further up into Wyoming, it will create industry, it will create jobs, um, it will supercharge our local economy, and it will boost our national economy. And that's just a microcosm of what can happen. So we're all in. We've been in for a number of years. We will continue. We are very pleased that three out of three of our um, congressional representatives are on board with the NIB. And I think uh, we will bring in our senators as well. We're very optimistic about the period of time that we're entering now. And uh, Alfeca has mentioned in one of her presentations, what is not to like about the NIB? And the honest truth is, unless you are committed to uh, the continuation of inequities and contradictions that have never made a lot of sense, uh, there's nothing not to like about this proposal. Thank you, folks. That's what I've got. All right. Thank, thank you very much for that, Dennis. Uh, you bring up some wonderful points. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, this is about trying to help everybody and to be able to have a plan moving, moving forward to be able to do that. Every citizen in the United States should be able to experience and be able to be in a position to be able to improve their lot and be able to have that uh, opportunity at the American dream. We have to figure out how to be able to uh, balance things where instead of billionaires having all the money, uh, we ought to at least have some of that trickle down here to the rest of us. And this is an opportunity to make that happen. So thank you very much for those. Uh, before we move into, uh, we got a few slides to go through here before we move into uh, uh, the question and answer session. Uh, so uh, first things first, uh, you'll notice all these logos on the screen here. I can't read them all, but I can tell you a couple of them only because the top corner one there, Toledo Area Jobs with Justice, is actually a group I'm very familiar with. I work with uh, as their secretary. But uh, if you look through that whole scheme there, there's a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, coalitions that are out there that are working towards the National Infrastructure Bank. I can remember when it was pretty small when you looked at that screen, how many people were on there. It's getting bigger all the time. And I will say this as I always do whenever I host these, is that every one of us has a connection with some group or organization. And we all need to be able to take this message to them and encourage them to really investigate the possibilities here and then to be able to use your influence. And we all have influence over some people. It may not be really high or you may not think it's high, but you start out by doing it to this, to the lower levels, it starts to percolate up and that's how things start to change. And so I would encourage you to be able to continue to take this message to any group that you're involved in and at least bring it up, bring up the subject and talk about how we can change. Because at the end of the day, uh, it's gonna take conversations to make that happen. Next, we have uh, our NIB action page. If you go to the uh, www.nibcoalition.com. You'll find out that uh, here's the latest updates. They'll tell you how many people or how many uh, congressional representatives we uh, have involved and some of the new news that might be happening. It keeps you up to speed as to what's going on and also allows you to be able to join the coalition and, and maybe get somebody you can bring in, uh, Alfeca, or to be able to come in and uh, via Zoom to be able to talk to a group that uh, needs to hear that message from an expert to be able to hear that. Uh, finally, we have a, a new NIB flyer uh, and trifold. 
Uh, you can basically get online, download this thing. So when you're going to talk to a representative or you go into your city council or you go into whatever, to be able to share some information. It's got a whole bunch of information in a, in a, uh, in a uh, <clears throat> basically in, in a paper form that you can actually hand. Because one of the biggest things I hear from people is, I don't know enough about it. I don't know how to be able to talk to it. This gives you a lot of the answers. You'll get an opportunity to be able to look at this. You can read. You can get some of the bullet points that are going on to be able to do it so that you can start to, to, to really be able to share the ideas. And you don't have to know them all. I always recommend pick one or two things that are really important to you. And those are the passion that will come through to be able to do that. And I think it's important that you find those one or two things that really speak to you and then allow other people to be able to look at it. And I guarantee you there's something in here for everyone if they'll go and uh, get that opportunity. Finally, and, and this is our, our big push uh, we're look, we're still looking for money to be able to go and make this uh, happen, this DNC uh, trip that we're uh, doing next week, where we're going to be in Chicago, actually talking to representatives, talking to um, not just representatives on a federal level, but also the state and local level. Because the one thing that the Democratic National Convention will have is everyone who's involved in, in the Democratic pro in the Democratic political party system will be there one in, in a lot of forms. And this is our opportunity to be able to reach out to them, to be able to shake their hands and to be able to actually get this information in their hands. And so we are looking for uh, some more money to be able to do it. We still uh, uh, are short about $3,500 uh, to be able to make this thing happen. Uh, we are looking for, if you got, if you got that rich uncle, or you have that big bank account out there, by all means, we'll take a large donation, but every little bit helps to be able to make that happen. Uh, we will be talking at the exhibit hall, we'll be talking uh, at a number of the state caucus breakfasts, and we'll be uh, in the uh, event set or in the event center being able to, to be a vendor to be able to talk to these individuals as it goes on. So I encourage you, that QR code will go and take you right to the donation page or you can get to it through our website. And with that, that's enough of my pitch. Uh, we're on to the Q&A. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and I will call on you and we'll see if we can get, get you a couple of answers here. Anyone? I'll chip yeah. in if I might. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm also a macroeconomist and on the advisory board. I just wanna make a couple follow up with a couple of comments. Uh, the point that OPEC made about the movement, or uh, Naomi made, about the movement to a financially-based country rather than an industrial-based country is absolutely crucial. But that requires two things, one of which we're talking about and one of which we haven't, and we need to understand that. And that is the National Infrastructure Bank is the only crucial piece that can build the industrial base of this country. If we don't have the, the industrial basis, whether it's high-speed railroad, whether it's an improved electrical distrib distribution system, whether it's broadbanding across the country, if we don't have the industrial base, we can't build the, the economy. And that's absolutely critical. And the National Infrastructure Bank is crucial to that. On the other hand, the financial sector may feel challenged by this. And that's gonna be something we're gonna to have to deal with because what we're talking about is relocating the guts of the country on an industrial activity, not financial profits made by game playing and derivative playing in, in the banking establishment. So that's one comment. I have three comments to make. The second comment is with, with regard to labor. We cannot move this country forward unless the economic base, the, the working base, of people like the, the uh, uh, tr Trump in, uh, campaign is addressed. And these are working people for the large part who have an absolutely valid position that they've been screwed for the last 40 years, to be very blunt. They're feeling aggrieved and they're right. They should be aggrieved. The industrial systems jobs that they depended upon aren't there. The social services they depended upon aren't there. And so basically, if the, the NIB and building up the, the infrastructure is the only way to put these people back to work in a, with really solid wages, because we're talking about in the bank of demanding that the materials that are used in the infrastructure be built in the United States. 
whether it's railroad cars or or or, met, or metal to build a bridge or railroad ties, it's got to be built here. That's jobs. And then there's a second level of jobs to actually do the building. Somebody's got to lay the track, set up the the, ele the electrical grid, build the bridges. And so the, the, the crucial part of this, of turning this country around, is by our saying we have the program that can really address the, the constituency that is supporting Trump. And I, I hate to get this really into politics, but that's the reality. You know, we, we, can, we can basically offer the people who are supporting Trump the jobs in the future that, that they otherwise won't have. And that's, that's a crucial part that we really haven't talked about. And finally, I think talking to all right now, we have an opportunity that is golden. I don't know how we pull it off, but it's golden. Kamala Harris has to have an economic program or she won't win. She has to be able to address that she has an answer for the economy. And we have to somehow get to her and her advisors and convince them this is the this is the magic straw. This is what this is the a, a program around the National Infrastructure Bank and what it can do that gives her the tool to address all the other problems that she, that economic problems that we have, whether it's affordable housing, whether it's adequate educational buildings, whether it's public health facilities, the infrastructure bank can address all of that, and that the, the national infrastructure is the mechanism that she can use as a basis for an economic program that could win over the country. And so, uh, you know, whenever we're talking to any of the Congress people and the others in the Democratic Party, in particular, and, and party, party operatives and people who are into politics, we have to push that the, the national infrastructure bank mm -hmm. is the answer and the only answer we have to really give the the, the mechanism that can enable everything else she's talking about with 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 the with the with, with the economic program. She can't just talk about spending money whether, whether it's for children or what have you, because there is no money in the national budget because of the debt. If we don't grow the economy, and this is the only way to grow the economy, the rest of it isn't going to happen. And we have to somehow convince her and her people of that. So those are, those are the three things I'd like to contribute. Thank you. Absolutely. And, and you're, you're right on the right on the button there to be able to do it. As a, as a member of the plumbers and pipe fitters for, for my whole career to be able to do that, those are the types of jobs that, uh, uh, that need to be advanced in this country to be able to do it. Uh, we have, a, I mean, our school systems and the rest of that, I can remember as an organizer, I used to go in, I used to talk to uh, counselors and the counselors used to say, oh, our kids are all college prep. Well, the problem is if you continue to force everybody into college prep, there's nobody to do the work that really needs to get done. And we need, and a lot of the people who are disenfranchised are the ones who work with their hands every day, who have felt slighted at the end of the day, who I have seen jobs in manufacturing get taken out of this country, mm -hmm. whether by Democrats or Republicans, because they both have done it and allowed that uh, to be able to do. We have to get back into uh, made in the USA, build in the USA, et cetera, to be able to do that. And that's the kind of investment we need to really demand. And, and I think you're absolutely right that uh, uh, this is a perfect opportunity for um, Kamala Harris to be able to say, this is something that we want to invest in to be able to invest in ourselves to make that happen. So thank you very much for those words. I just add one point to that. There are countries that have a model for this in terms of the labor side of it. You, when you have a strong union movement with a strong apprentice system tied to the educational system. So, for example, Germany has a whole series of post high school education in which kids go to school two, three days a week, and they're in, in apprenticeship programs the other two, three days a week, and they're basically learning skills and what have you. They come out both with the mathematics and whatever they, they need, but they also come out with real solid work experience and virtually guaranteed a job at the end of it. And, and we have to understand that there are models we could use to really build the labor force. And that if, we're, if the infrastructure projects are going to work, we have to have a much better and more skilled labor force. And there has to be a mechanism to do that. And those exist. We don't have them in this country, but they really exist. And they're models we can use. Absolutely. Without a doubt. All right. Thank you for those words, Andy. Uh, moving on to uh, uh, Don Sifkes. You're on. Please unmute. Now, I have a question and then a comment for Ellen. Uh, you, one of your slides said, if that doesn't work, then the NIB can issue bonds. I wasn't clear on what, what's that that might not work or doesn't work. 
Well, the question was whether we can get enough depositors <laughs> to, uh, you know, to provide the liquidity for $5 trillion worth of, even if you're leveraging it 10 to one, that's still a lot of depositors. But um, Alfeca actually said that we could, you know, she, it's really a question for her. <laughs> okay, very good. No, and that, that was so, not the no, no, question. My, my comment is somehow we need to get Alfeca, Nomi, and you, Ellen, onto television someplace. Now, I've been totally unsuccessful trying to contact producers at AB7, ABC7 News in San Francisco or trying to get Fox News, uh, what's his first name, Varney, to, to invite, invite them on. But we got 34 people on this call. Somebody has to know a TV producer somewhere to try to get this story on television, even if it's a local news, because really the bottom line is nothing happens in this country unless you get on television. So I'd like to ask everybody that's on this call to think about who they know that might know a local producer that'd be willing to invite Alfeca, Ellen, or Nomi onto TV to talk about this. That's my comment. All right, thanks. Alfeca, would you like to take a, a little bit of a stab at what he asked earlier? So the National Infrastructure Bank will be a true bank. That means that just like your local bank, it'll take deposits and then it'll use some of the money that comes in from those deposits to give out loans. So the first thing you need to do is to attract these deposits. The problem today is the Federal Reserve is monkeying around with the interest rates that have, that have, de, uh, that have pulled deposits out of banks because it used to be that they would pay you almost nothing on a deposit, maybe half a percent or something like that. But when the Fed raised interest rates, everybody who had deposits wanted the same 5% that they could you know, get in a money market or someplace else. So in the short term, the uh, when the NIB opens, hopefully soon, uh, it'll have to be very creative about how it attracts deposits. And then it'll have to offer loans at a little bit more than it's paying for the deposits uh, in order to give out the loan. So we'll, it'll be a little bit of a challenge uh, if the, as, as Ellen said, we have to collect maybe 2 trillion or 3 trillion in deposits, and then we'll have money, you know, through the system, you know, to make the, the loans work. But uh, um, we will have to offer, you know, a high enough interest rate to attract those deposits. If we cannot do that, then we can always use the RFC method, issue bonds, and then the money that comes in from the bonds, we can lend that out and at a little bit higher interest rate. So be flexible. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, Glenn, Ryan, you're on, uh, please unmute. Yeah, uh, Ellen, this is questions for you. You mentioned uh, about the growth of the Chinese railroad. Can you elaborate a little bit more on how that affected the middle class in China and the rise of the middle class there? Um, <laughs> I, I don't actually know. I mean, I can certainly guess, but I don't have any specific information on China. So, I mean, right now it's true that China, is, the economy in China is not doing so well, but it's not because of their infrastructure projects. It's because they over and well, it's because of private investors and they over invested in housing and it's the way they structured their their local their local governments had to give their money basically to the federal government. And so the local governments um, got into all this selling off land and for housing, but it was housing that was overproduced, what's it needed, et cetera. So anyway, they do have issues, but but they're way of building railroads and dams, et cetera, was brilliant. And if you see any videos of their infrastructure, it's gorgeous. I mean, it's hard to believe <laughs> that they can, I mean, just stuff like railroad stations are, you know, castles, yeah. Let, let me, let me if, I may, if I may add a couple of comments to that one. One sure. of the crucial things that China did was move a larger proportion of its population from poverty to middle class than any country has ever done in the world's history. They basically they basically took a one and a half trillion you know billion pe people and mo moved uh, more than a half a trillion of them, a half a billion of them out of poverty and into the middle class. It, it has never been done before, 
And it was done by who the hell do you think built those railroads? Who built those dams? This money generated jobs and, the, and income for, for uh, Chinese families that are, that are simply remarkable. And it's ma made a major, major difference. Now, there are some problems. A lot of the younger people want moved from their rural areas into the cities. They had to deal with housing. They try to deal with creating new new cities outside. That hasn't worked as well. They've got a major problem because they have not developed the sort of social security system for their elderly. The elderly depend on having, having large families. They don't have large families, and the kids are now not, not living near the village. So they the, the elderly are in deep trouble. And they're going to have to find a way to deal with that. So the, the, there are real pro there are real problems there. But they moved people out of poverty into a middle and created a middle class in a 10, 15 year period faster and more, larger than any country in the world has ever done in history. So it worked. The, the, other, the other thing I'll mention is with regard to uh, financing the bank, uh, what Alpaca said is all true, but the key thing to keep, on, keep in mind is the essential way you finance the bank is by repurposing the debt. You, 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 get, you, get, you get existing government bonds, and there are $28 trillion of them. You get a very small portion of those bonds to be deposited in the bank in exchange for preferred stock and, 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 a, and a little 2% margin. So they get the same interest they would have gotten 4 or 5% plus 2% from the bank on their preferred stock. And that's the mechanism. And that has been used before, not only here, but elsewhere, and every time every bank has used the basically the repurposing of national debt as the foundation for their bank, it has worked. And in fact, it's usually been, they've usually been able to basically finance their banks literally within a few months is all it took because it just worked. I mean, the, pe the people who are holding bonds just want to know that they're, they're safe as long as the, the bank is perceived as safe and backed up. They'll move some some people will move their bonds over and for the extra money and you're off and running. And so the idea that you're going to have to issue your own bonds is probably never going to happen. Andy, can I ask? So you said other countries have done it. Wait, besides, I mean, what are you thinking of besides like China oh, and us? European <laughs> European Union did it. It did it with one of the, their banks. The uh, the uh, what do you call it? Uh, the, the Germans have done it with their bank. It, it's it's been done before. And, and and it was the model that Hamilton used, and that's when we, when we talk about the American system that they're claiming that's that's the American system is the repurposing of national debt, not not the issuing of new money. I right. mean, you, bank creates right. money, but it's it's not that that's the key me mechanism. Alpaca is is in, is in touch with this, he knows this is far better than I. Do. Very Thank good. You. All right, uh, Dennis Montoya. You have some comments. Well, I just wanted to comment that Mr. Winnick's observation about the fact that we need tradespeople is not being lost uh, as a high school and middle school teacher we are encouraging our students uh, to go into the trades but something that you said um, was very on point what happened is for a while you could never go to college if you came from certain a certain socioeconomic and ethnic sector and I think we had an overreaction because now everybody used to be pushed into becoming an auto mechanic. Now you can't find an auto mechanic. What we need is a reimagination of who we are, who gets respected in society. And if your college, uh, if you want to go to college, go to college. If you want to be an auto mechanic, we need them. We need electricians. We need plumbers. So... Uh, we view the NIB as being part of the whole reimagining of our society. Absolutely. And, and, yeah, and, and I agree wholeheartedly with that. And one of the things that uh, I know Andy was talking about where Germany kind of goes and helps people figure out what they want to be. I think we need to do a little bit more of that here to be able to, to imagine that. One of, one of my biggest experiences, if you wanted somebody to go into trades at the time and get into something where their hands got dirty, you had to, you had to convince their moms for some reason because their moms were holding them back. Their moms wanted them to grow up and be doctors and, and the rest of that stuff. Moms didn't want their hands dirty. And I always said, well, the difference between that is that, look, I'm making a, a terrific living. I was able to retire at the age of 56 because I was able to go and do all that stuff. 
because I worked with my hands and I was able to get dirty. Hey, yeah, all that stuff washes off at the end of the day. And it's hard to sometimes convince moms. The other thing we had is, uh, and I hate to say it, in the trades, I can remember as a kid when I was in the trades, my uh, when we go to the uh, local picnics for the unions, et cetera, Every one of those people sat around and said, my kid's not going to have to work this hard. He's going to become a doctor. He's going to become a lawyer. He's going to do that kind of stuff. And uh, we allowed a whole uh, generation of people to, to, they wanted their kids to improve to be able to do it. The thing is, is that the construction jobs, we don't, all too often when we went to, uh, uh, when I went there and talked to uh, somebody who thought they would be a good candidate for, for the trades, they'd say, Here's Johnny. He he doesn't show up to school. He's terrible at school. He doesn't do any of these other things. Yes, the trades could be good for him, but the trades are not for for dummies. You have to be smart. You have to be able to do it. And people have a different sense of intelligence. There are people who are just mechanically gifted who are trapped in schools to be able to do it because they just don't have a way to be able to use their hands, use their knowledge, use their instincts to be able to do that. We have to figure out a way to continue to be able to unleash that. And this National Infrastructure Bank, I agree wholeheartedly with everything you're saying. It gives the opportunity for us to be able to invest in ourselves and to be able to rediscover what we're doing instead of allowing uh, certain corporations to say, everybody's going to go to college and we're going to do this and, and start that churn or whatever. We have to be able to figure that out. So, Craig Schwartz, you're up next. Oh, I just want to chime in on, on what some of the speakers have, have said before. I particularly like uh, what Mr. Montoya, I really appreciate. You, you muted yourself. Hey, I, I, I muted you. I'm sorry. I, that was me, Craig. Unmute yourself. There you oh, go. That's okay. I, my and my my screw up. That's all right. I just appreciated that. Uh, I, I forgot about Santa Fe's history, and uh, so I appreciated uh, you bringing that back about North America's oldest capital and how we have forgotten that. And moving forward, I mean that's that's forming part of our. You know, you're talking about uh, institutional racism right there. We we're dismissing that that part of our history, that formation. Um. One of the things that you guys are bringing up is is something that I just came across. I'm booking an event uh, for my own race, running for Ohio House recently at a Marion Depot that used to uh, uh, house the Inner Urban, which was a railroad that hooked up a lot of small towns in Ohio back in the 30s and 40s. And when I got to talking to the gentleman who's 81 years old, he re reproached me. Because he said, oh, you all of you politicians, you talk about bringing the railroads back, but you have no institutional knowledge or memory of what we once had and what it's going to take to bring it back. And it was actually a pretty good lesson. We talk about this a lot. and You guys are just talking about this now. This is a big task that we have in front of us about bringing back not just the you know, railroads, but all the other infrastructure and having to retrain thousands of people and tasked with that institutional knowledge and institutional memory. And only the National Infrastructure Bank can do this. And that was impressed upon me. I spent an hour with this gentleman the other day, and I got a fantastic history on Ohio's railroading. But it also reminded me of, the ta again, the task at hand. So um, I this this is you know this is why I do this why I preach this why I'm going to Chicago. We talked about Germany. Germany is a case in point of those people in most other European countries not losing that institutional knowledge or memory. That's why their trade crafts are strong. That's why their unions are strong. This is what we have to be rebuilding, particularly in, in rural Ohio. And this is the message that I bring in my campaign. And that's why it's resonating so well. I'm really, really emboldened by the changes, obviously, in the top leadership. Um, what Don, Don is talking about, what Andy's talking about, we have got to get the top of the ticket focused on this. This is really the most opportune time I've seen. I know all of us have seen this. We, I preach to the choir. But in Chicago, I'm hoping that we get the opportunity to really impress upon people in the DNC that public infrastructure, this kind of financing on a state financing level, 
man, this is the way to go. One other comment, Ellen, I'm sorry, but every time you that microphone, you're bringing it up to your, I think you're going to take a drink out of it. I mean, it looks like a koozie <laughs> to me. I got to say that. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Ellen, for, your hand raised. Obviously, you want to have a comeback to that one. For some reason, my regular microphone gives feedback and everybody complains about it. So that's why I use this thing. It seems to work. <laughs> Sorry. But I did have a quick question. You said institutional memory. Are you talking about the memory of how to do these trades? Is that right? Like somebody to train you with this. And the one yeah, comment I mean, was and I know okay. I got a lot, a lot of railroad railroaders on this line right now. This gentleman was talking about compression um, on the on the rails, what a class one could take, what a passenger rail could take. You know, the, obviously I knew the differences in, in in some of the things that we want to talk about. But he did admit that some of the pilot programs that we have been mentioned in the past, what I've talked about in terms of Columbus not embracing mass transit right now, particularly with the Intel project coming, he said it was perfectly feasible for us to do a pilot project right out of Columbus Terminal, right by the convention center, out to the, uh, the existing lines, to the airport, and out to New Albany. And if we do these kinds of pilot pilot projects, you will start getting, the the again, the people to embrace this and here comes the institutional memory back. We used to ride the trains here. We just forgot. Mm -hmm. can, can I, can I, the one um, comment I wanted to make was that uh, if you go into the trades, you, you don't come out of school with a $200,000 debt, which is the problem with getting a doctorate. Absolutely. Yeah, can, can I just, just as a, a matter of institutional memory, because this is something I taught, I used to teach. We have to understand that this, we used to have thousands of miles of inter between cities as well as inside cities rail. You used to be able to get from Chicago to New York by going from train by from streetcar to streetcar to streetcar. You had rail all over the country, and that did not go away because of the economic market. That's a lie. It went away because of criminal conspiracy, and that was proven in court. So, for example, you had a you had Chevron Oil, uh, I think it was Ford Motor Company, and one of the other one of the others put money together, bought up all the the uh, er, the interurban transportation systems, rail systems in the Los Angeles greater county area. Good here. Over sold the right away. Sold the right away. Andy, it was all run by General Motors. Yeah, yeah. General Motors, right? That's. Was. Anyway, right, my mom, they, they my then, mom's they then, they from then Los sold, Angeles. Yeah, they then sold the the right away back to the cities on the condition that they could only be used for vehicles Car powered by the internal combustion engine. They were sued in federal court. They were found guilty of restraint of trade. They were found a few thousand dollars and laughed all the way back to the bank. The, the, the what, what you can talk about is. It wasn't that the American people had a love affair with the car. It was a shotgun marriage. All their alternatives were destroyed and they have no no choice. And the route of the freeways is now the route that we used, used to be train, trains. So we had that history. And Craig is absolutely right. We have to relearn what we had, why it was taken away from us, and how we can get it back. All right. Thank you very much, Andy. You've been very informative today. And it was great to have you as part of this conversation. Uh, I don't see any more questions, and I look up at the clock here, and it says that it's 927. So if somebody's got one more pressing question, we'll take it. Otherwise, uh, we're going to end this thing here. I don't see any more questions. So I'm going to get uh, one more pitch. Uh, Tom, Go ahead. Tom Galloway's got his hand up. Okay, Tom. Yeah, uh, for one thing, we have a delegation from Toledo that's going down to ride the bright line to see what's been developed down in Florida. I talked to uh, Teresa Morris today, but we had a, we had service here in Ohio. I've got the schedule in one of my folders starting in 1902 or starting before 1902, the schedule I've got that connected Finley to Portage to Bowling Green, to a couple other suburbs, to Maumee, to downtown Toledo, and connected up with. It was the same thing. These interurbans, 
ran all over the little towns. And I've got the map that, that shows where they were. There are some places that you could still see the rights of way. And when I hired out in 69, you could still see the bridge abutments. And, and they were all over. I think there were 108 different lines here in Ohio uh, at the turn of the last century. That that uh, and some of them hauled mail and some of them hauled small parcel. So it, it the information is around and it can be found, and the rights of way are around and still can be found. Some of them have been turned into bike trails um, under the rails to trails program. Unfortunately, some of them have been sold outright, but but there there are discussions. Um, I've uh discussed some of this with Marcy Captor, where those where those routes were, where they can be now. And also uh one of the easiest things to do would be put a high speed rail corridor right down the median of I-80, I-90, the longest interstate in the in the com country is uh, I-90. It goes from the East Coast to the West Coast. Use the median. And there you go. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks for, for all those comments, everyone, as we go. I'm going to make one last pitch here. If you haven't had an opportunity to go to the website and, and donate a couple of bucks, uh, please visit the NIB Coalition, uh, uh, com or if you got your phone there, click on that uh, QR code to make your donation to help us to be able to continue to spread the word. Uh, everybody, keep doing your part. Uh, you're all doing great. It's all about uh, trying to get things going a little bit at a time and see what we can do. So have uh, fun at the national convention. I'm sorry. I said have fun at the national convention. Do your, you know, gonna, I make. We're, we're gonna try. Okay. Good.